Uh, welcome, everybody. It's uh, great to have uh, people in the middle of August vacation time um, at uh, Chevalier's, the oldest independent bookstore in Los Angeles since 1940. Uh, we have a very, very special uh, evening planned. Um, let me begin by talking about our interlocutor, who has been among our best sellers and a uh, great friend of our store, David Kippen. Um, David, of course, is a uh, uh, writer um, on the UCLA faculty. But most importantly for us, he's written Dear Los Angeles. If you don't own that book, you need to get it right away. Uh, there's never a day uh, during the year that there isn't something you can uh, learn from his book about uh, that day in Los Angeles history. It's smart, it's funny, it's interesting. And uh, when he's not uh, writing books and teaching writing, uh, he runs Libros Schmibros in the Boyle Heights, which of course is the uh, a free lending library. So David is uh, kind of an indispensable person to the uh, intellectual infrastructure of Los Angeles uh, and uh, uniquely qualified to talk to our uh, author guest tonight because David is uh, advocating a new um, federal writers project, um, not at all dissimilar to what Scott Borshett is going to be speaking to us about tonight. Uh, he's, uh, Scott has written Republic of Detours, which is really a must read. I have said off the record, and I'll say now on this record, that uh, this book will be shortlisted for the Pulitzer Prize. Um, it is a brilliant, captivating, in-depth discussion of a cockamamie idea of uh, gathering bunches of writers, uh, putting them to work during the time of the Depression, and um, what could go wrong. And really, this is a book about what went wrong in terms of having writers administer programs, but also what amazingly went right. It is uh, you know, a collection of some of the greatest uh, hits of some of the greatest writers. You get to learn their personalities. You get to read some of the things they've written. And uh, you'll be amazed at all of the things about famous writers you didn't know. And you'll be introduced to writers that now you're really going to have to read. Um, Vardis Fisher is a person whose name I never heard. And uh, now having uh, experienced uh, uh, his involvement in this project, you'll, uh, you'll want to find out more about him. For me, the discussion of the New York Writers Project and Richard Wright, being a guy who grew up in New York, was the most, uh, uh, most interesting. But to learn also that uh, Zora Neale Hurston turned into a hard right-wing conservative Republican toward the end was one of the more surprising aspects of this uh, well-written, interesting book. And I think um, it's fair to say that Scott came to this um, because of a great family connection. Scott has an Uncle Fred who collected uh, the uh, 48 uh, state guides that we'll be hearing about tonight. And um, I think the rest is, uh, is history, both in, in uh, what was written and the history that will be made by Scott's book. So thank you both for being here. Thank you all for attending. And I'll just turn it over to Scott and David for what I'm sure will be an interesting evening. Well, thanks, Bert. Um, not only uh, am I hoping that the Federal Writers Project will return, I'm hoping that with it, the word cockamamie will come back into common parlance. I've missed it desperately. <laughs> Um, we've agreed that the best introduction to the book is probably the beginning of the book itself. Um, it's, it's a beautifully written book in a way that I think is all too easily overlooked because it has a very uh, prominent subject matter. It's become kind of uh, a, a, more and more a, a, a going issue these days. And in a circumstance like that, it's altogether too easy to lose sight of what I think is some absolutely terrific American prose. So Scott, if you don't mind, and I, I gather you don't, um, if you could start us off with, with just a couple of paragraphs to set the stage. Sure, yeah, and let me say thank you, David, for talking to me tonight and Chavalier's book for hosting me and everyone who's tuning in watching this. Um, we'll have a good conversation, I think. 
But yeah, I'll just start, um, I'll read a little bit from the book here. Uh, what I'm talking about is the series of guidebooks called the American Guide that were kind of the signature edition of the Federal Writers Project. And um, kind of we can get to this story a little bit later, but I ended up with a full set of all the states that I inherited from a great uncle I had who was a um, book collector. He had a whole bit of an eccentric guy. He had all these you know, bizarre books in his house, um, but he had a humongous collection of the Federal Writers Project. And that's actually sitting behind me here, you can see. Um, in his original bookcase. So that's kind of where the idea for this project all came from for me in terms of the book project. Um, I had these books sitting in this case for years. I'd read them sometimes. I was always a little bit perplexed by them. I didn't really know quite what to make of them. Um, and then I started looking into the story behind the Federal Writers Project, and that's what you know, got me into this. So I'll just read a little bit here. Um, this is when I'm describing the American Guide books. And what they are. <clears throat> these books were all. They hoarded and gossiped and sent you down for a lecture. Scott, we need you closer to your microphone. We need you closer to we need you closer to your microphone. You're kind of fading in and out. Sure. I think. Scott, are you also holding anything over your computer? No. Okay. Sorry. That sounds better though. <laughs> I'll, I'll start again. Start again. Okay. I'll start again. Yeah. These books sprawl. They hoarded and gossiped and sent you down for a lecture. Seems to address multiple readers at once, multiple perspectives. They ran to hundreds of pages. They contained a melange of essays, historical bits, folklore, anecdotes, photographs, and social analysis, along with an abundance of driving fiction, written by tall tales, strange sites, and bygone people. They were deeply researched in subjects of little use to the public, the local government, states, literary residents, while they barely mentioned diners, hotels, and gas stations. They were rich and weird and frustrating. Most of the state guides provided two sections. First, Report readers page through essays on history, industry, folkways, and other subjects. Then came profiles of notable cities and towns, and finally, a collection of automobile tours and processes. The tours highlighted scenic overlooks and recreation spots, but they were also dense with Indian massacres, labor strikes, witches, gunfighters, continental army spies, Confederate deserters, shipwrecks, slave rebellions, famous smugglers, and forgotten poets. Travel through towns with bizarre names and towns founded by religious cults, point out arch curiosities, dubious monuments, and decayed wedding coats. They paused for every old summer story that could be passing through past the ground. They knew of ghosts on every road. They mentioned all the places where walking had ever slept and were linked to the proper form. They guided tours across the land, but also deep into the national character, into a past that was assembled from the mythic, prosaic, factual, and political. These tours seemed less destitute for motorists, a rambling day trip through the unsorted lines and as the shaggy opulence of Americana maximalism made the guides unusual, but the providence made them remarkable. And the fact is, they were created by the federal government through the Fed, Federal Writers Project. That's just where the story begins. Kelsey, Kelsey, we need to figure out how we can help Scott's um, audio here. Yeah, it Scott, would you mind we just... try turning off your video to see if that improves your connection? Sure. How's that? So far, so good. But read another couple of sentences so we can hear it over the course of uh, um, some some verbiage. Sure, sure. Where was I? <laughs> um, so basically, I said these books. You know, they were the provenance made them remarkable. They weren't issued by some erratic publisher or obsessive compulsive tourist association. They were in fact created by the federal government. They were researched, written, and edited by members of the Federal Writers Project, a division of the Works Progress Administration. Is that any better? It's, it, it's, it's beautiful now. And uh, I hate to ask you to play it again, Sam, but um, because it was so broken up and both David and I who have studied this book think it was so great, would you mind, um, mind starting it uh, again or excerpting it a little bit so we can have the context for the folks who are uh, here? Sure, that's fine. Um, so it sounds okay with the video running? It does. Now, yeah, yeah, now it's fine. fine. Magic. Okay. <laughs> all right. I will, uh, all right. I'll read the middle paragraph here. This is kind of the long part of talking about the different guidebooks. Um, most of the state guides were divided into three sections. First, perplexed readers page through essays on history, industry, folkways, and other subjects. Then came profiles of notable cities and towns. And finally, a collection of automobile tours across the state. The tours highlighted scenic overlooks and recreation spots. They were also dense with Indian massacres, labor strikes, witches, gunfighters, continental army spies, Confederate deserters, 
shipwrecked slave rebellions, famous swindlers, and forgotten poets. They traveled through towns with bizarre names and towns founded by religious cults. They pointed out architectural curiosities, dubious monuments, and the cage fitting posts. They paused for every old timer story that could be fastened to a patch of ground. They knew of ghosts on every road. They mentioned all the places where Washington ever slept and where Lincoln was ever born. They guided tourists across the land, but also deep into the national character, into a past that was assembled from the mythic and the prosaic, the factual and the farcical. The tours seemed less accessories for motorists than rambling day trips through the unsorted minds of the Republic. Great, great, great. Thank you. That was great. Yeah, sure. um, I, I love the subtitle of this book. And when I'm stumped or in a hurry to explain what the project was, oftentimes I just lean on this. How the New Deal paid broke writers to rediscover America. Um, the 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 four title took a little longer to grow on me, but now I absolutely adore it. Why is this book called Republic of Detours? So, what I kind the impression I got from looking at all these guidebooks is that it didn't give you this one kind of unified picture of the country or this idea of like America can be boiled down to this one concept. Um, really, the guys are, you know, I'd say these, these totally shaggy, surprising, um, you know, unkempt kind of collections of all sorts of material. And that's kind of, I think, a message that they're trying to convey, probably accidentally at first, but then I think it was sort of deliberate in the sense that they're kind of sketching out this version of American, the American story and American character um, that is messy and contradictory and full of all these dead ends and odd pieces that all kind of don't really fit together, uh, but somehow are held together in this big, capacious thing that you know, we think of as America, the country. Um, and so I like the idea of, you know, implying that these guidebooks are giving you a portrait of the of our Republic, um, but it's one that isn't just a straight line or it's telling you go from this place to this place. It's giving you a lot of detours and bringing you down these kind of forgotten back roads of American history and the American scene in the 1930s when they were written. Um, and so I just felt like this phrase captured that aspect of the guides and that messiness uh, pretty well. And then the subtitle, you know, that kind of captures the two main, um, you know, things about this project that I think are so important. Like on the one hand, it was the economic nature of it. You know, it's a relief program for writers that gave people jobs during the depression when they were so sorely needed. Um, but then it was also this cultural project to look, as I put it in there, rediscover America or to, you know, look into uh, the American past and forgotten American stories that had kind of fallen by the wayside and uh, recapture a lot of these things by putting them in these guidebooks. Well, I, I imagine um, the challenge in telling the story of these sprawling, messy books is not to write one of your own. Um, how did you go about organizing it in such a way that it all interlocks so beautifully? Yeah, that, that's a good question. So um, early on, I kind of decided in talking with my editor, too, that the best way to tell this story would be by focusing on a handful of people and make it kind of a group portrait. Um, because I knew there were a lot of pretty well-known writers who were part of the Federal Writers Project. And then there were these other people who are not very well known today or are never known at all, even during their time, um, who were really interesting nonetheless and you know, contributed important things to the project. Um, so there's a really rich cast of characters that I could draw from, but then I had to decide who to put in this book and how to arrange it. Um, so I tried to find a handful of people who you know, I thought would be interesting for readers who maybe wouldn't necessarily pick up a book about the New Deal or the Federal Writers Project, but might want to learn something about Zora Neale Hurston, for instance. Um, but there are some other famous people like John Cheever or Saul Bellow were part of the project as well. Um, so I wanted to get some big names in there and then some people who are not as well known. Um, but then I needed to kind of figure out how to, you know, give a sense of the whole project as a, as a national, you know, undertaking. So I needed someone from, you know, different states, different parts of the country, um, and people who are working on different themes or aspects of the project. So we have, um, starts off with this guy, Henry Allsberg, who is the director of the Federal Writers Project. He's based in Washington, DC with the national staff there. And so his story is kind of also the story of how the project came to be. And, um, you know, the, the forerunners to the Federal Writers Project um, in the part of the New Deal, like the other relief programs that they implemented before the WPA was created in 1935. Um, so he's one story, and then we have Vardis Fisher, who was in Idaho. He was the director of the Idaho Project and ended up publishing the first of the guidebooks. So his story is also kind of the story of um, where the different state directors came from who ran the projects in their own individual states. And you had you know, people like Vardis Fisher who were semi-successful novelists at the time, 
um, maybe got a lot of critical acclaim, but they didn't really earn a lot of money from their writing. So they were really the people who the project was designed for. Um, then you have someone like Nelson Algren, who comes next in the book, who was a young up and coming writer. He'd published one book that, you know, didn't really sell very well and he was totally despondent. Um, and he was also really involved in the radical politics scene. He was in the orbit of the Communist Party. He went to, you know, um, meetings at the John Reed Club, which was kind of a Communist Party affiliated organization. Um, so he was like part of that scene and it was very important to him and shaped him as a writer. Um, but so were a lot of other young writers who joined the Federal Writers Project along with Algren. So his story kind of captured that aspect of it. Um, Zora Neale Hurston, who I talk about, you know, she was based in Florida. Um, there's a very complicated story about how the project operated in the Southern states during the time of Jim Crow and segregation. And her story is very much a part of that as well. Um, but her main contribution was um, collecting uh, folklore and contributing bits of folklore that the you know editors in the Florida office would use and sprinkle into the guidebook um, or to work on this other um, project that was kind of a survey of black life in Florida that other black federal writers are working on. So her story kind of touches on those aspects as well. Um, and you have Richard Wright, who we mentioned before, who started out in Chicago with Nelson Algren, came out of that same kind of radical uh, political world and then moved to New York City because he wanted to focus on his own creative writing. He was another kind of up and coming writer. Um, and the Federal Writers Project really launched his career in some really significant ways. He won a contest um, for a, short, or a collection of short stories that ended up becoming his first published book. And it was like a contest for federal writers um, and then after that, he worked on a secret creative writing unit in New York City, which was something to go back to Henry Osberg, the director, he wanted to, uh, you know, put this in place in New York to give really talented writers the opportunity to work on their own creative writing, even though this wasn't technically part of the Federal Writers Project's mission. And he thought it might uh, get them in trouble if word got out that they were spending tax dollars mm -hmm. uh, by giving them to, you know, novelists and poets and telling them to go home and work on this stuff. So he ran it in secret just as kind of an experiment, see what would happen. And Richard Wright was one of the people who benefited from this secret creative writing unit, and he wrote Native Son while he was working on it, which, you know, became one of the most important novels of the 20th century. Um, so all of these stories kind of show you a different aspect of the project. Um, they show you like how the project operated in different parts of the country, because obviously it's a very different New York City where you had hundreds of people working on this project, a huge concentration of writers and researchers and, you know, other people who can, uh, you know, contribute to the kind of work the Federal Writers Project was doing. And then you compare that to Idaho, where you had Vardis Fisher and a small group of maybe around 20 people or so working on this, um, who he claimed were all incompetent. So no one was capable of writing the guide except for him. And he actually wrote it all himself, which I don't know if that was really true, but that's what he thought at least. Um, so the, you know, the differences between the, those two places and then you know, all the other places around the country were really vast. And the Federal Writers Project had to figure out a way to knit all these things together into one kind of functioning operation. Now, you're an editor, or you have been an editor um, at the very same publisher that publishes your book, although I gather you've taken at least an extended leave of absence for the time being. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about Henry Allsberg. Um, Is he a role model for editors everywhere? Did the, <laughs> did the American Guide succeed because of him or in spite of him? Um, I would say a little of both, probably. Um, Allsberg was this really fascinating character who had a very uh, varied career before the Federal Writers Project. I mean, he was, I, mean, I think he was um, in his 50s when the project hired him to be the director. So he'd done a lot of things. He'd been kind of a roving correspondent in Europe um, for the nation and for some other newspa newspapers. Um, he translated plays and worked in the downtown theater scene in, in New York. Um, he did a lot of freelance writing and editing um, for people like his friend Emma Goldman, the well-known anarchist was a really good good friend of his and he edited her memoirs. So he had this really interesting, diverse life. Um, and when they were hiring someone to run the Federal Writers Project, he was there because he was working for uh, the FERA, which was kind of the, the first relief organization before the WPA that the Roosevelt administration created. Um, he was just kind of around and they were looking for someone to run this and they looked at him and he seemed like kind of a sad figure. This is the story that someone told about it anyway. Um, and so they said, oh, let's just give this job to Henry Allsberg. So that's how he got it. but. He was sort of um, notorious for having this um, filing system where basically any you know, uh, memos that he got or something, if he thought it was interesting, he would save it. Or if he just thought it was some routine boring thing, he would crumple it up and throw it in the garbage. So he didn't actually have, that was the Augsburg, uh filing room system. So he was, he was known for being a pretty terrible administrator basically, um, but he had a, a way of working with people 
um, that could be very effective. And he was also kind of a visionary. And I think he saw that the Federal Writers Project was poised to do something completely unprecedented. I mean, the amount of, you know, the people and the resources that this thing was able to muster all across the country to kind of create this, this self-portrait of America had never been done before in any country or anything really like it on that scale. Um, and he knew this. And I think he knew that, you know, even though their main task was to give jobs to people, um, which he was always, you know, thought was very important. It was the key thing they were there to do. Uh, he also thought that they could create literature of great value. And I think he always pushed for the guides and other publications they ended up working on uh, to be interesting and to be as, as good as they could be and things that people would want to sit at home and actually read, not just, you know, uh, a boondoggle, which is what, you know, critics of the WPA called it. Um, and I think he was right. A lot of the best stuff, you know, you can still read them today and they're, people do and they're, they're great. They're really fascinating. Um, so he had, yeah, so just to answer your question, finally, he did have that mix of qualities that I think is pretty essential in an editor where you have these sort of, uh, you know, bad habits and, uh, and all that. But he had that kind of like visionary drive that um, I think made the work get done and made the work, or allowed the work to be the best that it could be because, because he saw the potential. Now, uh, I don't imagine he made your job any easier by crumpling up half the stuff that crossed his desk and tossing it across the room. What was the experience of, of researching this book like? Aside, I'm sure, uh, from you know, the simple uh, uh, prerequisite that anybody would do, which is read all 48 of the American guides that I see on your shelf behind them from cover to cover. Surely you did that. Yeah, well, the guides, I, uh, I didn't read all of them cover to cover uh, before I started the book. I, I read, you know, many of them, the ones I was, I was writing about in the book, and I paged through all of them and flipped through. But, you know, that's a pretty tall order to sit there and read every one. I'm sure I will someday. But, uh, but I didn't know. I did spend a lot of time looking at these and some of the other uh, Federal Writers Project material. And there's a lot of things online that you can find through the Library of Congress, especially. Um, but really, the, the records of the, the Writers Project are mostly held by the Library of Congress and by the National Archives. And the Library of Congress has a lot of the manuscript material. So this is like what federal writers were actually creating when they went out into the field and they were documenting their neighborhoods and their you know, towns and cities, um, going around writing up little lists of you know, every kind of factory that was in an area, local characters, you know, historical spots, basically everything. They'd write all this stuff up and then um, editors in the state would compile it into little bits of narrative. And then this is what they would use to assemble the guidebooks, basically. So all that stuff that survived, it's mostly in the Library of Congress. The National Archives has all the administrative records. So this is where you could really kind of like peer behind the curtain and see what was going on in the national office and then all the uh, you know satellite offices in all the states. Um, usually there's one office in every state in the biggest city. And then oftentimes they'd have little satellite offices scattered around the rest of the state. And sometimes it could just be a, a person or two at a desk in a, in a building somewhere. Um, but you know, for the most part, you know, everything was feeding back to these state offices and then feeding back to Washington. So there's a lot of material flying back and forth between the states and between DC, uh, you know, memos, phone transcripts, manuscripts, some other manuscript material too, a lot of letters. And my impression when I got there and started looking through all this stuff is that you could really tell that um, despite the, you know, the really heroic efforts of the staff of the National Archives, you can, you could kind of get the, the sense of what it was like in, you know, 1943, when the project was being finally dissolved, and some poor staff people somewhere in Washington were just throwing all this stuff into boxes, trying to get it all taped up and save as much of the material as they could. Because when you go through these files now, you'll find all kinds of things that you wouldn't expect to be in there. Um, if you're looking at a folder that should be memos about travel expenses or something you know, pretty dry and boring, you might come across this great you know, letter from Richard Wright to Henry Allsberg or something like that, talking about the new manuscript he's working on. Um, so it really was a little bit of like a treasure hunt um, going through all this stuff. And I realized when I first got to the National Archives that uh, you know, they have a, a lot of material. And I was speaking with an archivist there who's kind of the expert on the WPA records. And he asked me, um, you know, how many boxes do I want to go through eventually during my whole like, research process? And I said, oh, yeah, I want to look at all of them eventually. And he just like raised his eyebrows like that. He's like, you're going to be here for a very long time if you try to look at all these boxes. Um, there are hundreds of them. And they're in different areas. It's, it gets pretty complicated. Um, but anyone who wants to go can look at them. So they're all open to the public. And you can go look up, uh, you know, the boxes from your state if you want to do that. See all the correspondence that was happening in, you know, Idaho, for instance. Um, look at what federal writers are doing, and then a lot of the states have their own material as well. And like state archives or universities, a lot of times will have some of this stuff 
they're really scattered all over the place, but it's all there for people to look at. And, um, you know, it's a lot of it was never published. The majority of it was never really published. So it's a lot of great stuff in there that's still left to explore for people. And the American guides are essentially anonymous, right? They, they are credited to the Federal Writers Project. Um, is it possible always to know who wrote what? Can you, you know, ascertain that John Cheever wrote this and Saul Bellow wrote that? I know that, um, that much though we might look back on the project as sort of a, a halcyon era that we would love to recreate, it was not necessarily the, these offices were not the happiest places on earth to work for. In some cases, especially for the writers we revere today, because of course the, the manuscripts had to go through so many, so many layers of, of, uh, of editing. Um, what was it like to work for this project? And uh, can you always tell um, whose, whose prose you're reading between all these intervening filters of varying levels of competence? Sure. Yeah. It's it's really it's pretty complicated when you go in and look at um, you know the records because you can find the the original manuscripts that you know one federal writer was creating out in the field. Um, for instance, uh, like Margaret Walker worked for the project in Chicago, and so you can go to the Library of Congress and see things that she wrote where she was doing like interviews with people or just writing about a church that she she visited or something, giving you this like little narrative description of the church. You can find a lot of that stuff, and then it's hard, but you can kind of trace you know how parts of that might have ended up in the final guidebook or in drafts. Um, a lot of scholars who've worked on this, you know, long before I did have kind of figured out um, which parts of the guides, the most, you know, well-known writers who worked for the project um, ended up contributing. So we know that, you know, part of the New York City guide, Richard Wright did write about Harlem, you know, he's responsible for that. Um, there's this great passage in the Massachusetts guide um, by Conrad Aiken, the poet. He wrote this um, one description of a town that's just kind of so bizarre, but like very lyrical. And uh, it's really kind of a nicely written, just evocative, uh, you know, paragraph. And it's sort of like, why is this in the middle of the guidebook? It just completely stands out, but we knew it was him who wrote it. So um, you can figure out some of that, but a good story that I think kind of illustrates what it was like um, has to do with Nelson Algren, who wrote the guide to Galena, Illinois. And this is something I had heard about before. You know, Algren at this time had published, like I said, one novel. Um, he hadn't yet written his big novels, Never Come Morning and The Man with the Golden Arm, or his two like, great novels that came out right after he worked for, not right after, but after he worked for the Federal Writers Project. Um, so he still wasn't, you know, a well-known person outside of certain kind of radical literary circles. Um, but as he kind of moved up through the ranks of the project, he was an editor, and then, or he was in the field first, and then he was an editor, and then he was kind of writing things uh, like this, where they assigned him, you know, to write the guide to this town in Galena in Illinois. And I had read that he was responsible for the guide. He basically just wrote it and that was it and it came out. And if you look in the archives, you can kind of see that what happened was there was another person who wrote the guide first and then sent in his version. Uh, the Washington DC office didn't really like it. So they you know, went back and forth a few times. And then finally they said, find someone else to write this guide because this first guy isn't working out. So in Chicago, they assigned Nelson Algren. He never, as far as I know, he never actually went to Belina to see it in person. He just used all this research material that had been gathered by other federal writers and the first draft that someone else had worked on, took all this stuff, rewrote it, did his own version. Then they sent both drafts into Washington because they wanted to see it. And Henry Allsberg looked at it, another top editor there was going through it. And he basically said the Allsberg or the Algren version is better. So let's use that. But there's a lot of stuff from the first version, first version we should use too, and we don't want to lose it. So mix them together. And so someone there went through and highlighted things to keep from the first version, mixed them in with Algren's version, and then they ended up coming up with a clean manuscript. So basically Nelson Algren did write it, but so did a lot of other people. And you wouldn't really know that unless you actually go through the records and you look at this process, um, but it just shows you how it was really this collective process from top to bottom for almost everything. I mean, there are definitely exceptions like Vardis Fisher, we were saying, basically wrote the entire Idaho guide himself, um, but he wasn't really supposed to, and they were pretty angry in Washington when they found out that he did. But the guide is really, really well done. That's one of the best ones, I think. Um, so they couldn't complain too much. Um, but for the most part, everything was written by many, many people, um, you know, working on it together. There's that amazing quote from Algren where he says, there, without the Federal Writers Project, there would have been a lot more suicides. Um, that I just, you know, cherish that memory of the era and, and what the project did. You know, over the years, I think the temptation has been to think of the Writers Project as having created 
just the guides, just the American guides. Um, and then over the last year or so, maybe not surprisingly, um, it seems we've heard even we've heard less about the guides uh, in some cases than we have about the oral histories, than we have especially about the 2300 or so interviews with surviving enslaved people in their 80s and 90s. I wonder if you'd talk a little bit about what besides the guides the project did and about those thousands and thousands of interviews. Yes, the, the, the you know, slave interviews, but people from all walks of life, who, how did they choose who to interview? Okay. And what was the, you know, incredible, you know, miscellany of, uh, of people they actually bestirred themselves uh, to talk to and write down what, what their lives were like? Sure. Um, so from the very beginning, the, you know, when the project first got off the ground in Washington, they created these, this manual that they sent out to all the states. And it was kind of like the instruction guide for federal writers, once you joined, what you're supposed to do when you went out in the field, how to talk to people and some sample questionnaires and that sort of thing. Um, and then they ended up amending this manual, I think over 15 or 20 times <laughs> over the next couple of years, they kept sending out supplements and corrections to supplements. So it got, you know, naturally very complicated. Um, but from the very beginning, they were saying, you know, you need to go out and talk to people in the community. And especially you should look for older people who probably have this, you know, repository of memories of an area can tell you things that have been forgotten by other people. Um, but really go talk to everyone and especially talk to workers and immigrants and, you know, people who have this kind of lived experience that they can describe um, that would never get told otherwise. There's unlikely to get told otherwise. And so that's what federal writers are doing from the very start. And the idea is that this material kind of like weave its way into the guidebooks somehow. Um, they weren't really sure how, I think at that point. Um, but then that whole process kind of took on a life of its own, especially in the South. Um, there is a, a guy, uh, W.T. Couch in North Carolina, I think, who was working on the project there, who kind of um, became really, you know, um, fascinated by this idea of like oral histories and life histories. So he did this special project where he was sending people out all over the Southern states to collect these testimonials from people. And yeah, it was people from all walks of life. Um, but the emphasis was on uh, like ordinary people, poor people, workers. Um, they didn't go to a lot of like rich, you know, business owners or factory owners or something like that. Um, although they did a little bit. Um, and so that was all happening. And then at the same time, you had this parallel thing going on where they were sending out federal writers to interview formerly enslaved people who were still alive, you know, in the 1930s. These are people who have been born in slavery. Um, but you know, we're still around in, in the 1930s and we're usually you know, quite old at that point, um, but they were willing to tell their stories and just you know, their recollections of what it was like for them you know, at that time. Um, and this is something that actually started before the Federal Writers Project. There were a few black scholars who were doing this on their own independently. Um, and then after that, they, one of them got funding through the FERE, which is the, you know, the program before the WPA, the Roosevelt administration created to, you know, provide relief to the states during the depression. Um, so they got some funding for this, carried it on a little bit, and then that kind of fizzled out. The FERE was replaced by the WPA and someone got the idea of continuing this kind of work under the auspices of the Federal Writers Project. So yeah, both those things are happening at the same time and they interviewed thousands and thousands of people. Um, most of them are collected in you know, the Library of Congress. A lot of them are online. You can go look at these. Um, there was a book that came out while the project was still around. Um, called These Are Our Lives, I think. Oh, man, I should, I should look that up. But um, this was a, a collection of the, of the life histories from the South. Um, and it kind of gave people a glimpse of what the project was doing. Because yeah, people knew that it was creating guidebooks. This was kind of the point of the project. Um, then this book came out and I was like, look at this other stuff that we're doing. This is before or oral history was really kind of an established academic field. So um, it was kind of innovative for its time. Um, and it was only a glimpse of, you know, a small fragment of what the project had actually already collected and was in the process of collecting. Um, you know, in the end, it, it was thousands and thousands of more stories like the ones that were in this book. And a lot of them were published in later years, um, you know, after the project's demise. Um, but you can track a lot of them down online and it's still totally fascinating to look at these and get these glimpses of people's lives uh, in their own words. Um, I used to run a program for the NEA called The Big Read, uh, which would help cities and towns around the country do these one city, one book programs. 
And I always maintained that the best possible book to run a one city, one book program around would be that city's original WPA guide. We haven't mentioned it, but after it became apparent that these were going to be a hit, they were going to get great reviews, they were going to be bestsellers, they commissioned, in addition to the 48 states, guides to what wound up 40 cities, at least. Um, and, and I'm just curious. Um, what do you think the experience, what do you think is to be gained from going back, as I'm sure people will be dying to do after they read your book, and pulling down, whether electronically or via used bookstore in a library, their own hometown or state's WPA guide, whether it's to navigate by them uh, on roads, many of which have changed around since the 1930s, or just, you know, what is that stereoscopic effect? of reading a description of your immediate surroundings through the other end of an 85 year telescope. Yeah, I mean, I think that if you were to take some of these guides out today and use them as a, as a road guide, like go out in a car and drive around and try to navigate with it, um, you might have kind of mixed success because what <laughs> I've looked at and thought about that a little bit there, and you know, roads disappear, things change a lot. A lot of the landmarks are gone that they're trying to you know direct you to. Um, but if you're going from like town to town, you can still use it. And I think um, just doing that as kind of an exercise could be pretty fascinating for people um, to compare, you know, what was there in the 1930s, what people thought was important or worth mentioning compared to what's there now. We'll tell you a lot about what's happened in the, in the interim. Um, but just in general, the whole experience, I think, of reading these and the experience that I got from reading them, it's almost like your understanding of your surroundings gets thicker somehow. Um, like you might think, you know, the history of, you know, I live in New Jersey, so I know a little bit about the history of New Jersey and this region and what it's like here, how it's changed over the last hundred years or so. Um, but when you read the book, it's like you get this kind of like gritty detail and all these kind of fascinating things that you never knew about this area or little, you know, echoes of things from history that you kind of knew, but you never knew the whole story. Um, and it just kind of gives you the sense of that you're, you're not just embedded in this kind of you know, standard linear history of here's where the state or the city started and here's where it is. And these are the milestones along the way. It's like you're almost embedded in this much more complicated, messy story that involved a whole lot of people and a lot of good things and a lot of bad things, a lot of weird things. And it's all kind of mixed in there. Um, so this is kind of a philosophical answer, I guess. But this is what it kind of triggers when you're when you're reading these books and thinking about uh, where you fit into this. Um, and there's also just a lot of, you know, fun little facts and hear little stories that are sort of fascinating. Um, like one I always think of when I started working on this book, I was living near this park. It's like a county park um, uh, called Eagle Rock Park. And it's basically like, you know, not too far from New York City. It's a really high ridge. So if you go up there and look out, you can see Newark and all of northern New Jersey and then the Manhattan skyline in the distance. It's one of those great like lookout spots. And in the guidebook, apparently, there was a, a person who used to go up there in the 1930s and early in the morning, he'd get up to the top of the cliff and start yodeling. And because he was a, a yodeler and this was his thing. So he would do that every morning. And then people complained and the police came and got him, I guess. And so he went to the county and he got a permit. So he officially could go there every day for, I think, an hour and stand, you know, from 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. And he could yodel. And that's all he could do. Nothing like no instruments, nothing like that. But he had this official permit to yodel. And so I just got thinking, reading that, I'm like, is that, was that going on here in the 1930s from where I'm sitting? Like, would I be hearing this person yodeling early in the morning? Uh, my grandmother actually grew up in that town and she's not around anymore, but I wish I could ask her, like, did you ever hear this guy yodeling uh, when you were, you know, making your coffee in the morning or something? And that's something I never heard her tell that story. I never would have thought to ask it, but, you know, it was in the guidebook and that's how I learned about it. So you never know what kind of things you're going to turn up when you open these books. Now, I've got a quiver full of more questions here, so, so don't worry, I'm going to run out, but I want to put everybody in the audience on notice. I know we started a little late, but I hope we're going to get questions from as many of you as possible, um, so be thinking of that. We're going to open it up in a little bit, but in the meantime, um, I hope you'll tell us a little bit more about the life of this project. Who's crackpot idea it was. I was looking through another book about it, and it credited it uh, in part to the suggestion of some guy named Hugh Harlan in Southern California, who like wrote a letter to his old Grinnell College classmate saying this might be a good idea. 
Um, I don't know whether to credit that. All I've been able to learn is that he wound up uh, uh, as the founding editor of the Topanga Messenger. But, you know, putting him to one side, you know, how did this project happen? How did they let it keep going for, depending on how you calculate it, four years or eight years to finish up all the guides? What ultimately happened to it? Um, yeah, so I think the the original reasoning behind this project was that when the Roosevelt administration were create, was creating these, you know, relief programs, they wanted to provide jobs for people during the depression, um, you know, first through the FERA and then through the WPA, the Works Progress Administration. This is a, you know, well-known story, obviously. Um, but the WPA mostly created like construction jobs and manual labor jobs. That was the vast majority of them. There are millions of people who worked for the WPA. Um, but the idea was that, you know, there are a lot of other people out there who needed work who had other kinds of skills that they developed over a lifetime, whether they were writers or other kinds of people in the cultural fields, like cult of, uh, musicians or drama people, um, or just researchers, other white collar workers who maybe could contribute something differently um, than working on, you know, like a construction crew somewhere. Because obviously a lot of people were able to do that and needed the work. Um, but if you could kind of preserve these people's skills and put them to some kind of useful work where they could do something valuable for society, uh, while still working in the field that they trained in or they had a lot of experience in, then why not do that? And so there were some versions of this during the FERA, um, but it was really scattered. It wasn't like a coherent program. Um, so then when the WPA was created, there was this push to have an arts section. So there's this thing called Federal Project Number One, which is where all these arts projects were housed under. Um, you had the Federal Writers Project, Music Project, Theater, and Art, like a visual art project. Um, and they hired, you know, thousands and thousands of people from these different fields and put them to work um, doing these different, you know, socially useful things. And like for the theater project and the art project, there's a little more obvious what they would do. They perform plays or the music project would go out and perform symphonies, do music education classes and that sort of thing. Um, but the writer's project, you know, is a little more up in the air. So writing obviously is a very general kind of task. Um, and it would get a little dicey, they thought, if the federal government was paying people, like we said before, paying novelists and poets to write poems, you know, in their spare time with taxpayers dollars. So um, they were a little wary of doing that. So they're trying to come up with some something that they could work on that wouldn't be too controversial, would be kind of useful somehow. And at first, I think the Federal Writers Project was just going to be, you know, writing government surveys and basically like keeping tabs on the WPA and reporting on what they were doing around the country, all these great construction programs um, that, you know, were changing the landscape all over. Um, but at some point, like you were saying, someone suggested the idea of guidebooks. And it seems like a few people were kind of throwing this idea around. Um, it, you know, a guidebook made a lot of sense because it was practical. It was kind of this inoffensive, useful thing. Um, who could object to a guidebook? You know, there, why would anyone think that just is controversial at all? So what, what the thinking was. Um, so that eventually kind of became the main task that the Federal Writers Project was organized around. And they were still going to do government reports and some other things. But creating this one guide to America was the main idea. Um, but pretty quickly, they decided they couldn't just do one book. It had to be a series of books split into volumes, one for each region. Then they thought even that was a little bit too, you know, like hefty and confining. So they, they wanted to do guidebooks to every state. And then that, they kept just like splitting off and splitting off where they started doing, like you were saying, guidebooks to cities. They were doing guides to regions and studies of different ethnic groups and folklore collections from specific areas. So you kind of had this like splintering effect as the project kept going. Um, but that's how it started. You know, a guidebook seemed like an easy thing to do. No one would object, like, why not? We'll do this and people can use it and go travel around the country, stimulate tourism, get to know the United States a little bit more during the depression when everything was kind of thrown into question because of this great social and economic crisis. Um, so it seemed like a great idea. And then from the beginning, you had people who were criticizing the project and then found things specifically about the guidebooks to criticize. And a lot of this was kind of, um, you know, there are people who were just uh, objected to the idea of work relief at all, and especially objected to the idea of like the government hiring writers to do this kind of white collar work. A lot of people thought this was something that should never happen. The government shouldn't be involved in the cultural industry at all. Um, and then you had people who were picking out parts of the guides or focusing on people who worked for the Federal Writers Project and saying, this is radical propaganda, or these people are communists or radicals. They shouldn't be hired by the government. They're trying to use these guides to uh, spread communist subversive propaganda. Uh, so that became the kind of uh, narrative that most critics of the project were putting forward. And everything kind of culminated. This is a much more complicated story, of course, but everything kind of culminated in the uh, this uh, congressional committee that was started by a congressman from Texas, Martin Dyes, 
And this was the first uh, House on American Activities Committee. So they investigated all kinds of things, looking for alleged, you know, subversive activity. Um, but they really ended up focusing, in terms of the, the New Deal projects, they ended up focusing on the Writers Project and the Theater Project. They had all these hearings. They brought in a lot of uh, people who were, you know, had access to grind or were throwing out different kind of complaints about uh, how the project was run that, you know, didn't really hold a lot of water if you go back and, and look at them closely, uh, but created a lot of bad publicity for the project. And, and it had to, they had to deal with that from the beginning. There were attacks on them in the press from like the conservative press, especially that didn't like Roosevelt, didn't like the New Deal. Um, they were always kind of harping about the, the Federal Writers Project. But by the Dyes Committee, it really built up to this crescendo. And then uh, after that, there's another congressional committee that was, you know, working on the, the act to renew the WPA, and they ended up making a lot of changes where they fired Henry Osberg, they kind of devolved the project into this like state by state uh, fragmented thing, where it's completely different than the original project. So that's what David, you suggested, you know, had this shorter lifespan, that was in 1939. And that was kind of the end of the heyday of the Federal Writers Project. And it did exist for a few more years after that, but it was it was pretty different. Um, and mostly what it was doing was just getting out these guidebooks that were still in the works. Um, so that was kind of the, the rise and fall of the Federal Writers Project. It had this very innocuous sort of, uh, you know, idea behind it. Like, sure, let's make a guidebook. Who can complain? And the guidebooks turned into these really, I think, wonderful literary, uh, you know, volumes that you wouldn't expect to find anywhere, let alone being produced by the federal government. And then the whole thing became this very controversial, uh, supposedly subversive you know, operation, which wasn't really true at all, but that's what led to the downfall of the project. Until um, now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I hope it's no secret to anybody in the audience, I hope it's no secret to anybody in America that there exists now on the floor of Congress something called House Resolution 3054. It's called the 21st Century Federal Writers Project Act. It was introduced by a Southern California congressman, Ted Lieu. Um, and I'm, of course, curious. Why do you think the first Writers Project worked? How would it have to change um, or not change to work again? And, um, and you're an editor. How would, you, how would you be Henry Alsberg for a day or for longer than a day and, uh, and, and try and do it either half as well or even better? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, yeah, I first heard about this legislation. I know you were the um, driving force behind this. Um, you were agitating for something like this and then it you know, took on a life of its own with Representative Liu and uh, Teresa Woodruff Fernandez and now became this proposed legislation. So yeah, I was, I was watching all this and I was just completely you know, perplexed but very encouraged by it. Um, because yeah, I thought the Federal Writers Project for all the kind of messiness of it and all its, its failures and limitations, and there definitely are some if you go back and look at the way that they ran things and the way that they put together their guides and some of the stuff that's in the guides, especially. Um, yeah, there are things that need to be improved um, if we were to do this again, but it worked and it created these great guidebooks and it provided for people who needed the work very badly and launched a lot of people's careers and kept people alive. Like you were saying with Nelson Algren, uh, he noticed that so many people who worked for the original Federal Writers Project said things like that, where you know they, they noticed that people who were on it were just you know, uh, in the most desperate situations and the project literally saved their lives. And for people who, you know, would come in every day, it's like they were completely rejuvenated, just having that, you know, work, being able to work as writers again, or going out and looking at the country and doing this kind of valuable work really just changed their lives completely. Um, and of course, there are a lot of people who could benefit from something like that today and really need it. Um, so that's why I thought, yeah, of course, we should have another federal writers project. This is great. But obviously, the conditions today are very, very different than they were in the 1930s. Um, the internet, for one thing, <laughs> it kind of changes everything. Because back then, it was a novel idea to go out and to talk people, talk to people about their daily lives and just say, just tell me what you do every day and what it's like for you to work in this, you know, little general store or to work in this field. And, you know, like, what do you think about like, what, what's your average morning like that sort of thing. And of course, now most of us are just doing that all the time, posting on social media what we're doing every day. And people are doing this voluntarily and it's all out there. Um, but there's a way, I think, to harness that, to harness that kind of interest in documenting people's daily lives um, that an organized federal writers project can do and can really play an important role, not only in, in kind of organizing it, but also collecting it and putting it somewhere where people can, can examine it and look at it. Um, so that's why the point of this project is to create a, a you know, um, 
as an archive in the Library of Congress where all this new material would be housed. So we would basically be looking at how the country has survived the year of the pandemic and the ongoing pandemic, um, how it's changed people's lives, but also just how people are living in the you know early 21st century, what they think about the American story and the way it's gone right and the way it's going wrong, what they their lives are like, what kind of work they do, what they do to relax. All these things are really crucial if we want to understand what the country is going through and what it's like to live here. And I feel like today people understand that less and less, or it feels like we understand that less and less. So a new federal writers project has a really important role to play um, by kind of giving us this view of the country. Like I, there's a phrase I use in the book a lot, how the original project was out there creating this collective self-portrait of America. And I think that's exactly what the project was designed to do. And that's exactly the important thing that it could be doing today if it were to be rejuvenated, um, you know, for our different set of circumstances. But, you know, we still have a need for that kind of uh, self-portrait, I think, is really important. Now, you and I are both guys. Oh, maybe somebody has a question. Um, I'd, I'd love to hear it. I'm hearing a little feedback, maybe. Well, certainly nobody hesitate to raise a hand because uh, I'm having too much fun here and uh, it's not fair of me to uh, 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 you know, keep you all to myself. But in the meantime, uh, oh, I do see a question. I see a question from, from uh, the founder of our feast, as Bob Cratchit says of Scrooge, uh, uh, Bert Dykesler of uh, the savior of Chevalier books. What, what would you like to ask, Bert? So, so I have two, two things I'd like to raise. One is the pauper's oath, which struck me as um, a very difficult thing for a writer to have to uh, take. And second, there is the sub theme in the book about uh, communism and the extreme debates within uh, people who were communists, you know, the Trotskyites fighting with the Bolsheviks, with the Mensheviks, with all of that. How, uh, how important was all of that kind of internal tension to what uh, the birthing process of these books? And what was it like to have to be a, a author in a white collar life uh, executing a pauper's oath? Right. So, yeah, that was really important um, because the Federal Writers Project is part of the WPA you know, as a relief program uh, to be eligible to work for it. You had to be certified for relief, which meant you would go to, you know, your local relief office. They would usually interview you, sometimes send someone to your house to check it out. And you had to basically swear that you had no money, no income, no other you know, assets to fall back on. You were at the end of your rope and you needed this you know, relief job, basically. Um, so this would be, you know, an official public thing. And then you'd be certified then you can go on the project. And a lot of people thought that was humiliating. Uh, they were worried that it would kind of mark them forever in terms of getting employment, especially if these were people who were sort of middle-class white collar workers. Um, like you had a lot of people who were uh, worked in newspapers or were lawyers or clerks and uh, teachers, educators of all sorts. And they were worried about being you know, marked by going on relief and how this would affect their future employment. So it was a really difficult thing. And um, like Zora Neale Hurston, for instance, when she finally joined the Federal Writers Project in Florida, she had to go through this process. And um, it's pretty amazing because at that moment, she was probably the most widely published Black woman in the United States. Uh, but she still had to be interviewed by a social worker, say that she had no income, no other uh, prospects, basically, for any kind of gainful employment. And then that's how she joined the project. Um, and then I should just mention, too, like on every in every project, there was a, a small percentage of people who didn't have to go through this. And they were hired as uh, editors and like kind of the technical specialists who could get these things done, like get the books made, um, they had the expertise. So there was this kind of almost elite class inside every federal writers project um, of people who didn't have to go on relief and could just get this job. And a lot of the writers who we like think of today as being these big names who are part of it, they were all angling for these jobs. Um, of course, no one wanted to go on relief if they didn't need to. Um, but you know, only about 10% of people who worked for the project ever got these non-relief jobs. So there's always a source of tension inside each project. Um, but yeah, another source of tension for sure were the political, um, you know, different political leanings of groups uh, working on the projects. I would say it wasn't as big of a deal in like Nebraska, for instance, as it was in New York City. And in New York City, you had um, Trotskyists and you know, Communist Party members were physically fighting each other. Sometimes they would be causing disturbances in the office. In New York, there was also this basically fascist group of far right um, agitators who joined. There was only a couple people, but they made a huge stir. Uh, there's this whole really bizarre story about um, trying to, they, they tried to blackmail Henry Osberg and almost take over the project. They're going to the media all the time. Um, and then, you know, you have people in the WPA in their internal communications were like, these people are a bunch of fascists. We can't, we shouldn't 
negotiate with them at all. Like, it's okay if we just make it look like it's the fascists fighting the communists on the project and it all settles down. And it's kind of remarkable that they thought this was like an okay thing to just put out in the, in the media. Like, oh, it's just, you know, the squabbles between our fascists and communist members. But, you know, we're still getting the guidebooks out. Um, yeah, but that was definitely a big thing all across the project, but in the bigger cities, uh, it really, I think, shaped the life of the, the offices and it uh, disrupted some of the process of, you know, putting the guidebooks together and the other work they were doing. Um, like there's a story about, I forget his name, there's an editor, it might have been Vincent McHugh, this guy's an editor in New York City. Uh, one of his assistants he knew was a Communist Party member. And so he would kind of use this guy to like enforce discipline on the office. If he needed something done, he'd say, all right, you, we really need this to get done get done go tell the other party members that this is important and they should do it and so they would actually do it because they're all kind of following party discipline um but there was a time when this person stole a manuscript and they put extra of it in the daily worker because they were attacking the guy who wrote it is this whole you know kind of thing um but anyway he talked to the assistant and said i know you stole that so it better be on my desk by tomorrow and then the manuscript is back the next day so i think on some projects they they learned how to use these political factions to their benefit um, you had either a quote from, it might've been the same editor who said there was a guy who was a communist party member who said something like, oh, you know, we're just using you for our own ends. And he said, yeah, like, I think I'm really the one using you guys for our own ends of the project. Um, so it was complicated and it definitely got messy at times. Um, but, you know, in some offices, I don't think that really was an issue at all. You had personal conflicts for sure. And just people who would join the project who were not in any condition to work in an office setting, um, you know, who are just completely just wrecked by the depression or were alcoholics or had mental problems of mental illness. Um, like there was a lot of that because, uh, you know, the depression people were, were, you know, in these really dire straits and, you know, the people who were joining the project were the ones who were the, the most need of help. And so um, I think they tended to be pretty uh, generous and accommodating when it came to these personal conflicts in the office or just people who couldn't quite hack it all the time, but needed the work, they would keep them around and make sure they still had a job. Um, but then when the WPA would enforce cuts from above, then those would be the first people got fired. So there was always a lot of labor conflict in, in each project as well. Whenever the cutbacks were coming, there would be strikes and pickets and that sort of thing. Um, so the workers were always fighting for their jobs on the project, even while the WPA was sometimes giving them jobs, sometimes taking them away, depending on how the you know, the, the roles, the labor roles were changing from month to month, basically. Um, so. I'm curious, is, apart from um, the careers, uh, the individual careers that the project launched, I wonder if you'd want to speculate about the project's effect on the course of American literature in general. I mean, I, you know, the stat I always roll out, and maybe this is specious, is that, you know, in the 40 years before the project, Americans won one Nobel Prize. And in the 80 years afterward, they didn't win two, they won like 10. Yeah. Um, I, how do you think the project uh, shaped the course of American literature until now? You know, it, it's hard to say because there are so many different people who work for the project who are doing very different kinds of work. Um, I think for sure the main contribution, though, was that it put so many of these writers in touch with their local communities and it kind of encouraged them to go out and just get a really like almost like textural sense of what was around them, like the city they lived in, uh, the way people spoke, the kind of like qualities of life there. Um, and I think it moved people in some ways away from kind of abstract writing about America to a more concrete and particular uh, version of that. Um, like you don't think of John Cheever as someone whose work resembles the WPA books at all or resembles this kind of like oral history folklore sort of thing. But you can see little bits of it in, um, in some of his stories. And then in the, you know, Wapshot Chronicle, his first novel, there's a section um, where there's, he's writing about this woman in you know, Massachusetts and she has this long monologue and it looks like it could have come out of a file uh, that the W in the Federal Writers Project oral history, like it's the, and he might have taken something like that when he worked on the project. Um, so you see it kind of come up in people's writing in different ways. Um, there's a really interesting book by a scholar named uh, Sarah Rutkowski about, I think it's called The Literary Legacies of the Federal Writers Project. And she gets into this question a little bit more where she'll kind of argue that um, Nelson Algren, for instance, you know, he went into the project writing in this kind of like proletarian mode. Um, uh, and then, and then he, uh, uh, um, sorry, I'm getting some feedback. Yeah. Yeah. But he's writing, 
his writing changed a lot um, you know, after the project and became more um, personal. And, you know, it's, it's, you'd really have to look at like writer by writer um, to see how the project changed them. But I think there was this kind of reorientation towards looking at, you know, the content of American life in a really concrete way. Um, that wasn't necessarily something ever, like that was attractive to a lot of writers before this, even though, of course, people were doing it, um, you know, before long before the Federal Writers Project. But I think it became more of a dominant mode afterwards. I'm trying to let squeeze me, let it, me, but... David, David, let me interrupt because yeah. it's 11 o'clock. Yeah. It's 11 mm -hmm. o'clock uh, in the Garden State and we should let Scott uh, uh, Scott, move on with uh, with his life. I I just um, let me close it out by uh, by thanking uh, Scott and David. I thought this was fabulous, uh, so interesting. I was so engaged by it, um, and I'm quite serious about uh, the book. It, it's really, really a terrific, important book. You'll dazzle your friends when next March the Pulitzer Prizes are uh, are are awarded. And you'll say, oh, you haven't, you haven't read Republic of Detours yet. Uh, I read it last summer. So I hope um, everybody will be inspired to read this book. Uh, we'll be inspired to learn more about the Federal Writers Project. Uh, we can only hope that David's uh, passion will, will allow us to have another go at what turned out to be a historic, important, wonderful uh, uh, contribution by the United States government. But just uh, to say thank you again to Scott and David for really a terrific evening and a perfect illustration of why somebody would want to be involved in the independent bookstore business. So thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, David and Bert and everyone at Chevaliers for having me. It's been really great. I appreciate everyone tuning in too. Thank you. Thank you both. And, um, and uh, you know, next year when it wins the Pulitzer Prize, there will, of course, already be a new Federal Writers Project. And uh, Scott will get a whole lot of the credit for that. Everybody within the sound of my voice, um, write, call, whatever it takes, your congressman or your senator or both, and ask them to co-sponsor um, House Resolution 3054. Um, I think we've heard tonight just uh, how important the original was and maybe how important another iteration could be. Scott, um, I, 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 I thank heaven every day for the good fortune that your book came along at all, let alone at a time like this. Um, thanks thank you again. very much. <laughs> thanks, I appreciate it.